In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Jesus. Let us now acknowledge our sins and be sorry for them. I confess to Almighty God, brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask blessed may I have a virgin, all the angels and saints, and to you, my brothers and sisters, pray for me. May Almighty God have mercy on us. May He forgive us our sins and bring us to life everlasting. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O oh God, who see how your people faithfully await the feast of the Lord's nativity, enable us, we pray, to attain the joys of so great a salvation and to celebrate them always with solemn worship and glad rejoicing. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever. And ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Zephaniah. Shout aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgment against you. He has cast out your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear evil no more. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. The word of the Lord. Shout and sing for joy, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and it has become my salvation. With joy, you will drink water from the wells of salvation. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy. O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel.
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brethren, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let all men know your forbearance, for the Lord is at hand. Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, be thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord, alleluia. Rejoice in the Lord, alleluia. Rejoice with me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to preach the good news. To preach the good news to the poor. Let us rejoice. be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Chapter 3 verses 10 to 18. At that time the multitudes asked John, what then shall we do? And he answered them, he who has two coats, let him share with him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than is appointed you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Rob no one by violence or by false accusation and be content with your wages. As the people were in expectation and all men questioned in their hearts concerning John, whether perhaps he were the Christ, John answered them all. I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the tongue of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, John preached the good news to the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions for today. Question number one. Today is referred to in our church as the Gaudate Sunday, meaning the Rejoice Sunday. We believers are admonished to rejoice, even though our circumstances of 
Boko Haram, of banditry, of economic distress, of political confusion, even though our circumstances remain the same, we are exhorted to do what? Rejoice. Now, question. What is the basis of this joy? And how do we find it? In our second reading, from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, St. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Philippians chapter 4 verse 4. So, it's not only from the book of Zephi prophet Zephaniah that we had as our first reading. The second reading also says, irrespective of the circumstances we find ourselves in. So if believers are to rejoice irrespective of their circumstances, what is the basis of that joy? How are we to find that joy? Because some people came to church today with long faces. Long faces behind the mask. The mask doesn't make it better. Right? The mask complicates it. When you have an uncheerful face and you now put mask, Especially if the mask is like Patricia's own that is black. Inya's own is white, so she may be smart, she may be frowning inside, but we don't know, isn't it? Question two. What according to the readings of today does it mean to be happy in the Lord? Related to the question one, right? What, according to the readings of today, specifically according to the, what does it mean to be happy in the Lord? Question three. Not think. Okay. Think of a single word or phrase that adequately captures the entire message of John the Baptist. Throughout this period of Advent, we are hearing about John the Baptist and his message. Can you give me one word or one phrase that adequately summarizes, captures, one word or one phrase, captures the message of John the Baptist? Question four. What, if anything, is going to change in your life in the conduct of your life after hearing to this message, this message. First reading from Zephaniah, second reading from Philippians, the gospel, the message of John the Baptist. What is going to change in your life or in the conduct of your life after hearing this message? What will you do different from what you used to do to pave the way for the coming of Jesus' kingdom of peace? That Jesus' is coming, Jesus' is kingdom of peace will come, be sure. You and I can delay it. You and I can fasten it, can hasten it. Do you understand that? Do you know that human beings can delay God's plan? Oh, of course we can. But we can also do something to hasten its coming. What can you do to pave the way? I mean, we heard John the Baptist talking about, last Sunday, talking about smoothening the road, pulling down mountains. If God's um, Lamborghini is going to pass and the road is full of hills and deep gorges and valleys, it will delay now. What do you think John the Baptist meant? John the Baptist meant do something so that when the Lord is coming in, his journey will be smooth and it will be faster, isn't it? So indeed, there are things that could be on the way that make it more difficult. So, what if anything is going to change in your life after hearing this? And you know that, let me emphasize this. Every time we read the word of God or hear the word of God proclaimed to us, Something should 
change in us. The word of God, we are told, is a double-edged sword. Nobody should hear the word of God and go home exactly the same. Did anybody ever meet Jesus and return exactly the same? No. That is why you and I should go to church expectantly. We should go to church expecting that something is going to happen to us. Many do go to church expecting that some material thing is going to happen. But much more than material things, something to happen to our being, not just our having. Many expect something to happen to their having. But what is it? And Jesus actually wants to make an impact more in our being than in our having. What is it that will change in your mode of being? B-E-I-N-G. What will you do to pave the way? Jesus means to end all this nonsense going on all over the place in our society. Jesus means to reign his peace in our society. But Jesus wants us to pave the way. What must you do that can pave the way for Jesus' kingdom of peace? Helen didn't know before today that human beings can delay God's plan. All the misbehavior that is going on is delaying God's plan. You, you think that God doesn't want to end all this nonsense today? Today, He wants to end it. But He's waiting for us. You remember those pictures I have put in the homily before? Jesus has no hands anymore but my own. Yeah. So Jesus needs our hands, He needs our legs. He has handed over His mission to us. Yes, Emmanuel. I want to answer question two. To be happy in the Lord means that we should be glad, we should rejoice because of everything that he has done for us. According to the first in Israel, we should sing and shout for joy for the inhabitants of Judah after they came back from exile because of what the Lord did for them. And the second one is talking about having no anxiety because we should be happy in the Lord and we should trust that through prayer and supplication he will answer our prayers. Okay, we should be happy because through prayer he will answer our prayer. And we should have no sadness over anything because God is going to help us. Only we need to put our trust in him. Okay. God is going to help. Give Emmanuel 70% of it. Yes, we talk about. I want to attempt question three. Okay. A single word or phrase that adequately captures the entire message of uh, John the Baptist. Uh, for me, it is spiritual renewal. Spiritual renewal. That, that encompasses social justice, honesty, kindness, and generosity. Somebody is helping you. I haven't finished waiting until I finish. <laughs> he said before you help him, he let him finish. So that he doesn't need to share the percentage with you. <laughs> yes, so spiritual in, in, uh, renewal, renewal that encompasses social justice. Social justice. Kindness. Kindness. Honesty. Honesty. Generosity. Generosity. Repentance. Okay, let's, let's, let's put it the other way around. Repentance and spiritual renewal that encompasses, then list the others. Yes. Because the very first step is repentance. Aha. And it is, it, is the, it is evidence that you have repented that you are able to do all the ones you are saying. So repentance should not come at the end. Repentance is actually, repentance can summarize the whole thing. Right? So repentance. Rep repentance expressed in spiritual renewal that includes this, the this, this. I say it so that you can get the percentage. The key word is repentance. Yes. That encompasses or entails 
secure in you, huh? Yes. To push you justice, honesty, kindness, generosity. Give him. Do we give him 100%? Yes. Yeah. Yes, perpetual. Please, let me attend. Question number one. That it's the Rejoice Sunday. We believers are to rejoice in. Even though our social circumstances remain the same. Yes. What is the basis of this joy? The basis of the joy is because our Lord, the Messiah, is coming. The Messiah is coming. coming. God is about to visit his people. He says, daughters of Zion. First reading. Daughters of Zion. Your God is in your midst. Your God is coming. Rejoice. And when he does come, what did he say he will do? He will dance. As on a festival, your God will not only celebrate you by nodding that you are doing here, your God will actually dance for you. That's the basis of the rejoicing, yes? Before now, every believer must have been fed up with what is happening, the circumstances around us. So the news of his coming brings hope. We've known already that what is happening is not where we belong, except we are sure or except we are mindful of where we belong. That is where. So even news of his coming should bring joy. Yes. And that's, that's significant. Do you understand? Yes. Everybody is fed up with circumstances of the world and of our society. Yes. So just the news that the Messiah is coming. The news that the Messiah will right all wrongs should already bring joy. joy. Yes. Then and how do we find it? It's by constantly believing in his word. Constantly trusting in his word. Because he that has given us a promise can never fail us. Trusting that we're going somewhere, we not belong. We don't belong to this um, place. We are not for this place. Though we are here in the world, but we are not of the world. How we find it is that we hold on to His word. Yes. Make His word the lamp for our feet and the light for our path. Mm -hmm. Hold on to the word of promise, and then we shall. The Lord who always keeps to his promise, will make his promises come true in our life. Yes, Give me a round of applause. <laughs> yes, Ellie. Let me attempt question number four. What, if anything, is going to change in my life after hearing this message? Now, everyone has to actually think of what is it that will change in your life. It's just that we don't... We don't have sufficient time. Otherwise, at this, at this stage, it is to just let everyone sit down and write something down. So, not listen to Helen alone. That's just how. But the 100 people sitting down here have to think of what is it that, are, that will change in my life. To what extent have I been impacted by God's good news? And what is going to change? How will I, what will I do to pave the way? That's to say, please don't consider yourself spectators in this. You are not spectators. You are active participants. Yes. Yes, Father. Um, what is going to change in my life is contained in the message of um, John the Baptist. I read it last night. I read it this morning. And then I also looked at what Jesus also said in a similar circumstances. That if somebody asks you for your your cloak, you should give him your cloak also or something. Saint, uh, John the Baptist is saying that if I notice that somebody needs something and I have, I should not hesitate to share with the person. That something needed may not be material. You need to hear the word of God. 
you need to rejoice because the great one, the creator of the whole universe is in your midst. So what else should matter to you? Two days ago, I was miserable, I was lonely, I felt as if the world was carving onto me. But when I read this message, I knew that I have to change to trust more in the Lord, that he's in control of so all circumstances. So one thing that is going to change yes. is that you trust, trust more in the Lord. Yes, okay. and then I'm more generous okay. with everything God has given me. To be more generous. Yes. Trust more in the Lord. Be more generous with everything God has given me. Thank yes. You. And also to believe in the word of the Lord that do not be afraid. Do not fear. I'm holding your right hand. I'm going to be with you. Do not look at the circumstances. Because if you look at the circumstances surrounding you, you'll be discouraged. Look at me and give me your hand. I'm going to take you out of this. Now I'm not going to put a time limit to that. Simply because God has said so, it is done in my life. So I have cause for joy. Give her a round of applause. Yes, Ebenezer. Oh, you have not finished. Yeah, the second part of the question. What will I do to pave the way for the coming of Christ's kingdom of peace? To live an exemplary life to be of courage, to do the right thing at the right time, irrespective of the consequences, to read the Bible more, to pray more, to have more dark hours of the soul. By dark hours of the soul is when I shut out everything, and in the darkness that surrounds you, you know that the Lord is there holding your hand. So not to surround myself with things of pleasure, be things that would lead me to joy in the Lord. Giving time, making space in my heart, in my life, for the word of God, for God's presence. And that will not happen when my, my life is overcrowded with all kinds of things. Great. Yes, Benedict. Um, Father, I actually wanted to answer question one, number one, um, which she answered uh, very well. But I would just quick, want to quickly add some few things to it. Uh, when I read, and I, whenever I'm reading the Bible and I get to that Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7, um, most of the times it meets me in situations where things are not working well or things are when, when I'm not happy. And I was like, why would I have to rejoice? In spite of all this, why will I rejoice when I'm hungry? Why will I rejoice when some odd things are happening? A hungry man is an angry man, yes, after all. Yes, yes. And uh, thanks to your book, the meditation book you launched sometimes. One of those days I was reading it and I went through it and went through your commentary. The Holy Spirit ministered to me. He, took, he opened my eyes to the, the, I mean the, the verse that followed that for the Lord is coming. And that the Lord is coming to attend to my needs. The Lord is coming to, to heal me. The Lord is coming to feed me. The Lord is coming to make provisions for, for my lack and the, the challenges I'm facing. The Lord is coming to take it away. And that I should rejoice. And that, that rejoicing has, it linked me to the fruit of the Spirit. I talked about kindness, love, um, charity, and the rest of it. And said, you cultivate it. They, don't, they are not inbuilt. You, don't, you are not born with it. You have to deliberately make your mind that instead of me swimming in my bitterness and my sadness and, and my sorrow, I would rather choose the path of rejoicing because this thing has a magnetic, magnetic and radiatic, radi radiative effect. It magnets, if you rejoice, it magnets more rejoicing to you such that when you learn to live the life of rejoicing, in spite of your circumstance, in spite of the circumstance of Nigeria, and the bad things we hear on daily basis and the bad things we see, by the time it begins to manifest its magnetic effect, naturally, things will be happening in your life that will eventually make you to begin to rejoice. We shall discuss, perhaps discuss this a little more after Mass. Remind me, because this whole thing about uh, positive vibration, mm. um, exactly. uh, positive vibration, what some, some people call positive magnetic field, uh, the fact is that um, like attracts like. You've heard that before. Like 
attracts like. So, if you go around, you wake up in the morning and you are going around with a long, gloomy face, please don't be surprised if negative things happen to you through that day. But if you wake up in the morning and you start smiling towards everyone that you meet, don't be surprised when many positive things happen to you. Why? Because like attracts like. Your cheerful face, in spite of your problems, in spite of the problems that you left at home when you got up in the morning, your cheerful face attracts positivity towards you. So we shall discuss more of that. But it is very important for people to know. Now you wake up in the morning and you are going around as if you are carrying the whole problem in your head. Jesus has not, God has not put the whole problem on your head for you to solve. You do that, what happens is that the problems get heavier. Mm. But when you smile in spite of the problems, your problems get lighter. And what happens? Maybe the persons that will actually be the solution to your problem will be attracted to you. They will come close to you. Reason? Because you are cheerful. Everybody is carrying enormous burden and load. Me, I don't want to go close to the person whose burden is heavier than me. Yeah, because when you are, when you are going and your face is heavy, what it means is that your problems are, are heavy. So, me with my own problems, when I look at you, I will look at where the brighter side is. Naturally, we'll be propelled towards the brighter side. That's why it doesn't help any of us to be going around with long, long faces. You know? So this made me to know the true meaning of the fruits of the Spirit. Now you develop love naturally by deliberately cultivating the habit to love people. You develop joy by deliberately cultivating the habit that today, in spite of this, you develop happy, joy by being joyous. I will be happy. You develop love by, be, by loving. Yes. You learn to drive by driving. driving. So you develop all this by learning it. Even down to long suffering, you develop it so that no matter the situation you... No, 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 my people don't like long suffering. <laughs> mm. Thank you, Father. Uh, make it short suffering. Make it short suffering. <laughs> Give him a round of applause. Rejoice. The reason why we are rejoicing is because the Lord is near. Today's readings are dominated by the admonition for believers to rejoice. The basis for this rejoicing is no other than the Lord is near. It's as simple as that. So the answer to question two is because the Lord is near. In the first reading, Zephaniah urges Jerusalem to rejoice because the Lord stands in her midst and will deliver her from her enemies. The prophet recognizes Israel's predicament. But he insists that the challenges of the day were not beyond those who call on God. They should not give up their hope in God's power to save. He says, rejoice in hope, trust and be confident. Be reassured, your God is near. He is in your midst. He is a victorious warrior. You have nothing to fear. As you know, by the time Jesus Christ was leaving his disciples, he says, I am with you always. So, it's not just that our God will come. We Christians are assured that our God is with us. Is that not what Emmanuel means? God with us. Your God will renew you by his love. He will rejoice over you. He will even dance. I wonder what kind of dance that God will dance. He will dance for joy over you as on a day of festival. That's a powerful image, isn't it? I mean, just give it a thought that our almighty God will dance for us. What joy. In the second reading, Paul also calls some believers to rejoice because the Lord is near. For the same reason. 
Because the Lord is near, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always again. I say, Rejoice, rejoice again, Lord always again. I say, Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice again. I say, Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice again. I say, Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always again. I say, Rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always again. I say, Rejoice. Paul insists that for believers, there is no need to worry. If believers need anything, they should simply pray. Even as they are praying, they are praying with joy. Because it is only joyous person that can do thanksgiving. So pray with thanksgiving in your hearts, he says. Now in the gospel, John teaches those who came to hear him how to prepare for um, a joyous encounter with a Savior whose coming is near. For John, the way to the true happiness, the true happiness in the coming dispensation is the way of repentance and conversion. So, as uh, as Obike said it, repentance and the things that follow repentance. Repentance and conversion, and they are expressed in what? Can you read them? Selfless love, generosity, kindness, truth, honesty, justice, humility, mercy, and compassion. They follow repentance. They are an expression of conversion. You don't tell somebody I'm converted, and you are not showing all this. No, no, no. The evidence by their fruits, you shall know them, right? The evidence that you have have repented of the old things, the old things that are listed in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17 to 19. Now, the new things that Ebenezer referred to, fruits of the Spirit, they are the evidences that you are converted. Those who want to be part of the happy dispensation must change and take on this way of life, this new way of life. When the people asked John, what must we do? He said, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. I mean, this is very simple. You know, if you remember a few Sundays ago, we read about the the young man, the rich young man who came to Jesus and said, what must I do? And Jesus Christ says, uh, he says he has done everything the the, 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 the law says. Jesus Christ said, yeah, this is nice. Go and sell everything you own and give to the poor and come follow me. That one was harder, isn't it? John's own is not so hard. (laughs) You understand? John's own is not so hard. If your wardrobe has two shirts, take one and give to the person who has none. If you have food on the table and you have one for tomorrow and somebody has not eaten today, Give the one you are reserving for tomorrow. Give the person because you don't know what will happen the rest of the day. Simple but profound, isn't it? To the tax collectors, you know that the tax collectors, hmm. where is Charles? Uh, Tax collectors, sometimes tax collectors collect more than they are. uh, Sometimes tax collectors, they they do deals. Uh So, to tax collectors, they too say, what must we do? He says, collect no more than the amount prescribed. The soldiers too came and said, we incur, what must we do? He says, do not extort money. Hmm. Sounding familiar, isn't it? (laughs) Sounding familiar. It's like they came here to learn. Do not extort money from anyone through intimidation. Because one person hold gun, that's already intimidation now. Through intimidation and false accusation. False accusation, Kai. Be just, be honest, be fair in your professional conduct. Even till today, this is the message that all our, all our people who hold guns should have, isn't it? Many Christians today think that we can simply add Christ to our lives without subtracting sin. 
That's a problem, isn't it? I mean, soon now, this is Christmas season, you see all, all the jumping around that Christians are doing, including Suya Nights. All kinds of jumping around. But sin? No. We are still reckoned as the most adulterous country. Most unfaithful, people with the most unfaithful set of wives and husbands. Uh, now we are, having, we are having another record of being um, with drug addiction. One of the highest in drug addiction. It's serious. God's time, do you know about it? It's a very serious case. So me, I'm asking, so who and who are going to church? I mean, those who are scoring, making Nigeria score the highest in marital infidelity. It couldn't be any of us, isn't it? It couldn't be any of us Christians. Those who are scoring the highest in failing paternity tests. They couldn't be any of us, right? Those who are scoring the highest in, the, in patronizing pornography. They couldn't be any of us, right? Those who are scoring the highest in corruption. They couldn't be any of us. Something is wrong if any of us is part of all this. Because we are making ourselves a laughing stock before the world. We cannot embrace Jesus without something changing. That is why I said with that question four, I said, no, it's not only Helen that has to answer that. All of us have to answer that. Because when we hear, did you see what happened when the tax collectors went. The other people didn't sit down. The other people also said, and me, and us. The soldiers, and us. So each person has his message from God. And each person, there is a change that must take place, isn't it? And you have, you have to, each time you go before God, you have to consider, you have to empty your heart before God and think, what is it that has to change? Allow the light of God to shine in and through your heart and you will see what needs to change. And then if you are to even make some more progress, ask your best Christian friend. Ask your wife, not during the moment of quarrel. Ask your wife when you people are very agreeable. Your, your wife is likely to know some areas of your life that need to change. Your husband is likely to know some areas of life. In fact, ask your children. They are likely to know, but they have been afraid to tell you. Isn't it embarrassing that there is often hardly any difference in moral behavior between many Christians and others in our society? This is what I lamented two years ago when I wrote that thing about infantile Christianity or that this particular kind of practice of Christianity is not working. This is what I meant. Christ coming calls for a total transformation, not some superficial adjustment. We think we can do some superficial adjustment by which, for example, we say we are Christians. We keep patronizing the babalao, the, the shrines, and so on, so on with, our, with our rosary in the neck or with our Bible in the hand. Right? It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. No wonder we are not seeing a major transformation in the life of people. Because you are hanging the rosary, you are hungry, hanging the cross, and you are going to... Okija Shrine or Babalao Shrine. And the parameters are different. The principles are different. That is only an example of how we are living our life. I hope you know. We laugh when we talk about somebody holding Bible and going to Shrine. But that's how many, most Nigerians are living their lives. That deep down, deep down, when it comes to serious decisions. 
when it comes to serious decisions, I mean, recently they were talking of a person that has a problem, and um, they said the parent, some, some relations came and said, did they know him when he was born? Where is Gregory? Ah, yeah. Do, do, do you understand? I'm a man. Ah, yeah. Now. When they gave birth to him, did they know him? Did they go to find out from the traditional religious people, traditionalists, who he is? Uh, Helen, you don't know about that one, have you? To know whose spirit came back in this person. Um, our people, people are still doing all this and are combining it with Christianity. No wonder our Christian life is not bearing fruits. No wonder our Christian life is not bearing fruit because we are struggling to combine what is not combinable. Christ coming calls for a total change. It is not about some superficial change of dress or what. It is not about adjusting beliefs. It is about transformation. The kingdom that Jesus Christ brings is a kingdom of joy and happiness. Happiness is a universal desire. All human beings desire happiness. But many today believe that religion is an oppressive force, that the true practice of religion will hinder their freedom and curtail their happiness. Some of you think so, not so. We could now talk through. Eh? That true practice... You see, I hope you remember... That many times here, I have asked people to make, get up and make a commitment. And people have been afraid to make commitment. And when I talk about our starting a covenant community and that people will actually make a commitment about how they are going to live their Christian life and put it in writing, many people are afraid. So how somebody will come and I say, okay, say the act of contrition after confession. Say the act of contrition. Okay, before then. Um, can you, before you go, can you make a promise that you will never commit any this, commit this sin again? And the person says, you know, you know, man, we are, man, no be wood, we are safe, we are in the flesh, and since one is in the flesh, one cannot say, the, eh? Then I ask the person, okay, say the act of contrition. When the person says the act of contrition, I am very sorry that I have sinned against you because you love me so much. And by your grace, I will not sin again. I say, what have you just said? Is that not a commitment? Is that not a commitment? So you mean you just rattle through act of contrition without thinking? That's a commitment. That's not the kind of commitment that you should make and get right up from there and go and commit a sin again. No, something is wrong with you. You'll be sick upstairs to do that. You understand what I'm saying? The reason why many people are afraid to make such commitment is that they think that to practice Christianity truly, that it will reduce their happiness. It will reduce their freedom. It will make their lives dull and depressed. It will make them unsuccessful in politics, in business, in social life. But you know what? Such thinking, such people are mistaken. Because people think that way, that is why they prefer to laugh with the sinners than to cry with the saints. Those who really know the goodness of God and the joy of the Lord and the beauty of God's house will rather cry with the saints than laugh with the sinners. And parents, please take note. And all of us, this thing is about 
the whole distinction between instant gratification and deferred gratification. Do you want to eat to eat your dessert before you eat food? Or you want to eat food first before the dessert? Do you want to fill your tummy with junk today, which is very palatable to the, to the mouth, but begins to destroy you, destroy the whole of you from the stomach? Or do you want to eat some of those herbs that are not so sweet, but which build you up and build immunity for you? That's, that's it. So this, is not, this message is not different from the message that Felicia preaches about eating well. Do you want to eat a lot of sugar, a lot of sweet things? Enjoy it. Enjoy the taste today. But from tomorrow, next tomorrow, you are going down with illness. So ultimately, which one is better? Actually, most sin that we commit, they are a choice for instant gratification than deferred gratification. Do you understand? Show me which sin. Show me which sin is not an act of instant gratification. Because when people think of the consequences on the long run, many things we do, we will not do. True or false? I mean, let's, let's take something like anger. Somebody provokes you and you flare up in anger. Instant gratification. So you are gratifying yourself to, to, to tell him or her, to give it out to him or her as he or she deserves now. But you are not thinking of your long-term reputation. You are not thinking of what you are saying from the mouth, what the impact will be. People, somebody insults you on Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and you immediately, you insult back. You are forgetting that everything you put on social media will be there in a hundred years' time. Right? And that you may go for an interview for a job before you even enter, before they call you into the room. They have checked the internet to check all your conversation. Do you understand? But you have acted in the moment. You have used momentary anger to respond. You were happy that you were able to give it out. But what is the long term effect? So I say every sin is some kind of instant gratification and ignoring deferred gratification. People who think that to be truly religious is uh, to de deny themselves of happiness and of whatever, they are mistaken. Jesus' earthly ministry is punctuated by dinner, banquets, and luncheons, as well as parables of the kingdom, depicting lavish receptions and celebrations. I mean, it is not for nothing that the very first miracle of Jesus is the multiplication of, of um, the transformation of water into wine. To show that he is not a dull, tepid person, he has come to bring joy. And when he saw that people were going to be embarrassed, the young couple were going to be embarrassed because they had no wine, wine had run out, he multiplied, I mean, he transformed water into wine so that they had plenty of wine left for better wine that they had at the beginning. Celebration. Then we see... Jesus appearing in the house of, of Matthew, the tax collector, at a dinner. Zacchaeus, at a dinner. And he is constantly telling parables of the kingdom in form of a wedding party. It is not for nothing. Jesus wanted to show that the kingdom of God is a kingdom of Joy. So he begins by saying, the kingdom of heaven is to be compared to a king who calls for a wedding party for his son. 
St. Paul says, it is for freedom that Christ set us free. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Do not walk yourself back into the life of slavery. So whoever thinks that my freedom is curtailed by serving the Lord faithfully, you are mistaken. Because actually it is the maker, it is the person who has created you and who has given you freedom. He is the one that can really guarantee your freedom. You see the freedom that Adam and Eve had? When they violated the commandment of God, they, were they free? We are told that the next moment they began to see that they were naked. We are told that they began to hide. Is that freedom? One generation after, Cain killed his brother, Abel. Is that freedom? Life became a torture for them. Is that freedom? This, the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 31. The prodigal son, she, he wanted to exercise his freedom. He went to his father and said, give me the part of the property that belongs to me. The father wasn't happy, but the father shared the property, gave him his own, and then he expressed his freedom, instant gratification. Went to far away land, blew the money, enjoying, as it were, quote unquote, enjoying. But a moment later, he was begging to eat the husks that pigs eat. And he was able to trace his way back and said, even the servants in my father's house are enjoying more than this. So which one, if he had remained in his father's house, or what he went, which one is real freedom? Remain in his father's house. St. Paul, who lived a most faithful Christian life, tells the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, I want you to be happy always in the Lord. I repeat, what I want is your happiness. That's another translation. But he says, the happiness could only be found in the Lord. So that's why that song that says, rejoice in the Lord, oh, always take it. Rejoice. He didn't just say rejoice always, but rejoice where? In the Lord. So the basis of our happiness, the basis of our rejoicing is in the Lord. It is in the Lord and nowhere else that we have this rejoicing. We find our happiness only by living a life consistent with the values and ethos of the kingdom which are sacrificial love, service and humility and purity and compassion, forgiveness and non-violence. True happiness, lasting happiness, authentic happiness cannot be found in the blind pursuit of wealth and pleasure and power. I teach a course on happiness, as, as you all know, and there are very many opinions about happiness, about what makes people happy. There is the hedonistic view, meaning to have minimum stress, to have maximum pleasure and minimum stress. That's what it means to be happy. That's called the hedonistic view, the pleasure view. Then there is something called the view on meaning. The kind of view that people like Aristotle and others had who says that happiness comes from living a life of meaning. That life of meaning may entail a lot of pain, a lot of sacrifice, but true happiness results. Like a mother that takes care of a handicapped child into adulthood and is able to see that handicapped child beginning to help herself to do a few things for herself, that woman is more happy than the person who just won millions and millions. So living a life of meaning is the route to happiness in the Lord. There is widespread confusion, like I say, in our day of the pleasure sensation with, the joy, and with joy and happiness. Pleasure is completely different from joy and happiness. Pleasure is of the body. But joy and happiness are 
of the spirit. One can easily become tired and depressed or experience regret after a bout of pleasure. When you booze well, well. Or take some of this, what, are, what is now going on, some hard drug that they enjoy and have a high feeling. One can experience regret. You can get tired of it. But one never grows tired of real joy and happiness. Nor does happiness lead to any regret. Real happiness. If there is anything you think makes you happy, and the next day or the next year you are regretting that you did it, then all you experienced was pleasure. It was not happiness. Happiness does not leave any regrets. Can you say it to your neighbor? Happiness does not leave any regrets. Pleasure can leave many regrets. Let me tell him. Pleasure can leave many regrets. One can get enslaved or addicted to a pleasure act. But joy and happiness are always liberating. True happiness, however, comes from living an authentic life of integrity and service and sacrifice fueled with a sense of purpose and meaning and propelled by the love of God. You want to be happy, serve someone. You want to be happy, be, make some sacrifice with meaning. True happiness comes can you answer me when I say true happiness comes from sharing, from giving, from serving others, from promoting the welfare of others, from bearing the pains of others. Not making others suffer for our own selfish gain. What God wants is that we be happy. True godliness results in authentic happiness. Religious people, those of us who are trying to be religious, we should be the happiest people in the world. Because properly understood, faith in God is a liberating force. When me I see people who make all the money today, who get all the following today, and tomorrow I hear that they are on drugs. I just said, it just confirms all this message now. Some even commit suicide. Some drug themselves to death after making all the money in the world, after having all the followers in the world. Can you see that simply making all the money, simply make, having millions of people following you, is not enough for the human spirit. The human spirit wants something more. Faith liberates us from all the forces that enslave us and cause us unhappiness. Faith helps us find our joy in the world. Um, all the prophets of old, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and his apostles have taught us that authentic happiness lies in living a life consistent with the purpose with God's purpose and consistent with our beliefs. Someone says, how happy is anyone who rejects the advice of the wicked? Psalm 119 says, they are happy who follow God's law. And Jesus Christ says, well done, Matthew 25, 23, good and faithful servant, come and share in your master's happiness. Happiness is not a shallow self-indulgence. There can be no happiness as long as the things we do are different from the things we believe. For example, with us Christians, a certain sadness descends upon us when we refuse to love and forgive, right? When we refuse to share, when we engage in corrupt practices, when we engage in the blind pursuit of fornication and adultery, a certain sadness descends upon us. For the Christian God's presence is the source of our most profound happiness. When prophet Isaiah says to Jerusalem, shout for joy, he explains that this is because the Holy One is in your midst. And when St. Paul says to the Philippians, rejoice always, again I say rejoice, he explains that because the Lord is near. 
Where God is present, there is joy. The joy of love and hope. The joy of peaceful conscience. The joy of grateful heart. The joy of a trustful soul. The joy of a glowing hope. Where God is present, sorrow and mourning disappear. For he heals our broken hearts and mends our bruised bodies with the touch of his love. Where God is present, greed and avarice are replaced by sacrificial selflessness and sacrificial love. Oppression and intimidation are replaced with, by, by what? Mercy and compassion. Social injustice and economic exploitation are replaced by? Which allow many to live their lives to the full. Rejoice in the Lord, O oh you just, for praise is fitting for loyal hearts. Rejoice in the Lord, O oh you just, for praise is fitting for loyal hearts. Sing unto the Lord a new song for praise is fitting for loyal hearts. Rejoice in the Lord. Oh, you just for praise is beating for your heart. Make a joyful noise to our God. For praise is beating for loyal hearts. Oh, you just for praise is beating for your hearts. Dance to the Lord, faithful ones, for praise is beating for loyal hearts. Clap your hands to the Lord, for praise is beating for loyal hearts. Proclaim his wonders day by day for praise is fitting for loyal hearts. Oh, you just for praise is fitting. Take a look at Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15, the announcement of when Jesus began his public ministry. Repent. And believe the good news because the kingdom of God is close at hand. Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. Happy are the poor in spirit. Isaiah 25, 6 to 9. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all people. And Luke 7, 24 to 28. Of all children born of women, there is no greater one than John the Baptist. Let's reflect on these things for a moment. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this Gaudate Sunday. Thank you for this message of joy through Prophet Zephaniah and through St. Paul and through John the Baptist. Thank you that in spite of our dire circumstances in the world and in our country, Nigeria, we are having today a message of joy. And the reason for our joy is that we know you are in our midst, Emmanuel. And we are preparing to celebrate once again the feast of Emmanuel, God with us. Lord, heal us of all our wounds. Amen. Wipe the tears of all those who cry. All those who are in misery on account of the multiple tragedies of our land. Lord, wipe their tears. Amen. Comfort those of us who have lost relations. Comfort those who have lost loved ones in the midst of all the violence in our society. Renew our joy. Grant us the joy of your presence that in spite of our present predicament, we may truly 
be able to rejoice in you. Make us agents of this rejoicing to our brothers and sisters through Christ our Lord. I believe in one God. Sisters and brothers, let us now turn to God with all our petitions for the church, the Christian church, for the world, and for our troubled country, Nigeria, that is, that as we anticipate joyfully the celebration of the incarnation at Christmas, God will intervene powerfully in our individual and corporate affairs and help us to overcome our present political, social, economic, and especially security challenges. Let us pray for the Holy Father, Pope Francis, for church leaders at all levels, that they may have the grace to constantly teach the men and women of our day Jesus' message of love and give loud witness to this message with lives of service, sacrifice, and compassion. We pray, O oh Lord. Let us pray for all Christians everywhere that we may prepare for Christmas this year with lives of ardent faith, sacrificial love, unwavering hope, and transparent humility, in such a way that our religious celebrations will bear fruit for the church and for humanity in general. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord yeah, Let us pray for all who hold public office in our country, that they may discharge their responsibilities with utmost fear of God, sense of service, and stewardship, always showing special concern for the lowly poor who are dear to the mind of Christ. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord hear our Let us pray for all those who are traveling during this Christmas season. May the good Lord go with them protect them from the hazards of our villages and roads and cities today and bring them back safely. Amen. And may those remaining behind enjoy utmost security and peace during this season. Amen. We pray, O oh Lord. Lord hear our Let's pray for the evangelization and leadership development programs of Luke's Terra Leadership Foundation and for the intentions of its partners and benefactors. We pray, O oh Lord. Let us now pray in silence for our personal need. Let us ask for the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Oh, 
Almighty Father, your Son Jesus Christ became man that we may become children of God. Heal us of all our wounds today and guide us along the way of true life. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> and brothers that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. Amen. May the sacrifice of our worship Lord we pray be offered to you unceasingly to complete what was begun in sacred mystery and powerfully accomplish for us your saving work. Grant this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For all the oracles of the prophets foretold him, the Virgin Mother longed for him with love beyond all telling. John the Baptist sang of his coming and proclaim his presence when he came. It is by his gift that already we rejoice at the mystery of his nativity, so that he may find us watchful in prayer and exultant in his praise. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, you are the founder of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, this gift, we pray, by sending out your spirit upon them like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. 
For this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, and the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of our faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world. And bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, Ignatius, our Bishop, Anselm, his auxiliary, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray. That with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be coerced to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil and graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Bow at each other, wish each other peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Bless are we who are called to the supper of the Lamb.
Let us pray. We implore your mercy, O Lord, that this divine sustenance may cleanse us of our faults and prepare us for the coming feasts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This Mass is ended. Let us go in the peace of Christ.